I just want to begin by introducing myself and then situating us on these lands. So I'm assistant professor with the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning here at Boise and as Lois pointed out, director of the Center for Indigenous Educational Research. I am Ganyagahega, English and French descent from up the upper Mohawk Valley in southern Quebec. I am also a member of the Six Nations of the Grand River community, which is my husband's community where I've lived and raised my family. I offer the following uh, acknowledgement of the lands upon which we gather today. This land has a long entangled history that carries the storied footprints of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabek nations who have sought to walk gently on this land. Takaranto has a treaty with the Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nations and is part of the Dish with One Spoon Agreement to share the lands between the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee nations. We also acknowledge the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. This panel discussion entitled Indigenous Resistance and Resurgence, Reimagining Indigenous Arts as Education and Research aims to activate and develop Indigenous artistic actions and engage in critical conversations regarding the politics of reconciliation and education and research by exploring the ways art might act as a catalyst in forging new, respectful and meaningful relationships. First, I wanna to introduce to you the moderator of this esteemed panel of artists. Ange Loft is an interdisciplinary performing artist and initiator from Ganawage, uh, Ganyagahega territory working in Sitakaranto. She is an ardent collaborator, consultant and facilitator working in arts-based research, wearable sculpture, theatrical co-creation and Haudenosaunee history. She's also a vocalist with music collective and forgive me if I mispronounce this, Yamantanka or Taka, the Sonic Python. Thank you, Ange, for moderating this panel. Over to you. Thank you for having me, Sandra. I'm so excited to be able to speak with this wonderful uh, group of people. Um, so, um, as Sandra mentioned, yes, I am a multidisciplinary creator and um, I've been dabbling in the world of education. Um, so I've run into a lot of these wonderful uh, people you'll be hearing from uh, a couple of times over my career in the past few years. It's been um, really nice to kind of be able to think make art, make our ways into this, um, this world of uh, Indigenous education and informing other folks of uh, some Indigenous context and some nice ways to be and make art together. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I would love to introduce uh, some of our panelists we have today. Um, I would love to introduce actually quickly, um, some of my connections to these people. So uh, Maria Hupfield, I had the opportunity to be some of the first moving bodies in a, a giant gallery in Ottawa together. So we together helped to co-create and present a nice piece um, together. Uh, some of the first moving bodies inside the gallery space together. So thanks for providing that opportunity to me. Uh, Jennifer Wemigwans, we've been having uh, good conversations, thinking about other kind of tools we can use through um, educating people, working on uh, wampum orientation, thinking about ways that we can communicate through mass uh, different types of media forms and collaborating uh, with my work, Talking Treaties. Uh, Vanessa Dion Flesher, it's been wonderful to, uh, you know, be a uh, actually an artist in residence alongside with you. I've been truly inspired by your practice and quill and exploration of various shapes we all need to know about. Um, and then the last but not least, Tannis Nielsen. Um, it is wonderful to have your acquaintance for, uh, I don't know, since the first time I got to Toronto. You're one of the first people I met here. Um, and I'm so inspired by some of the work that you've done, particularly uh, particularly and still that underpass. So I keep thinking about that underpass and like what we can do to uh, bring some of those more stories of uh, really key, key native people that we need to be talking about, right? We need to understand some of their narratives. So thank you for bringing that to uh, the attention of uh, Toronto in general. With that in mind, I would love to hand it over to, um, in that order, people to introduce themselves about three minutes each. Feel free, take it away, uh, Maria. Wow. Okay, let's do this. Um, my name is Maria Hutfield. 
I'm a transdisciplinary indigenous performance artist. I'm gonna share some images so you can get a sense of what my work looks like. So I believe that the gallery is a site of um, live in-person experience. And I also think of the gallery as a sort of stage where things can happen. So I thought I'd like to show you, you know, what an exhibition of my work often looks like. We see a lot of felt things. Um, they're, position, it looks very modernist. I mean, I think galleries are often sites where work is um, decontextualized. So I'm often looking to put things back in relation with people, places, um, community. Here you see me performing with a triangle, ridiculous, moving two by fours around the space, um, a lot of action happening, um, myself and solo, but often in proximity and collaboration with other bodies as a kind of non hierarchical approach to um, a discipline that is very focused on the singular male white genius, very a lot of white supremacy. Um, so really wanting to, you know, bring my family back in, think about myself, where I'm from. And then this last image here, you know, looks like a very simple um, group of individuals who are hand drumming. Um, but what you're not able to see or hear is a song that we're singing, which is Bikini Kill Rebel Girl, um, you know, a very punk song. So I just wanted to kind of share some of those to give you a sense of my materiality and the way that I move thinking about embodied experience and the importance of story work um, that is really prevalent in my practice. Um, I'm also a member of West Soxing First Nation. That's a community I belong to. And I spent nine years in Brooklyn, New York. And I run a space at UTM where I, I teach um, and the space is called the Indigenous Creation Studio. So we're always looking at different projects. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on what's turning out to be a really beautiful day outside. <laughs> thank you. I would love to um, hear from now Vanessa Dion Fletcher. Hi everybody. Cool uh, for you. Wama Awang, Nida Shinzi Vanessa, Nia Mangamatit, Konjai Elmapali El Kait, Wak Potwatomi Aking, Wak Europe, Shakiwiki on Toronto, Ni Nogi Windham, Kwaikiski, Goski Wasko, Wak Watso, Wali Ni Pahom, Ni Ndalok Nakpi Pitilak, Matikish Aptone, Kwaiji Shwanakwe. Uh, so I just wanted to start with a little introduction in the Lenape language. Um, that's my uh, maternal family's um, language. So I said, um, how is everybody? My name is Vanessa. Um, my relatives, uh, they are from El Mapawi El Kait. That's um, the name of my grandmother's reserve, also known as the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town. I live in Toronto. Um, uh, just a few other notes about the day. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> um, I make, um, uh, yeah, and I make pictures. Um, so yeah, I've been learning um, for coming up on two years, taking some language lessons, and that's been um, a really great influence on my life and. Um, artistic practice, and I'm also going to share some pictures with you. So I uh, work with a lot of different materials. Um, on the left, we've got a wampum shell. And then I was on the right side reimagining um, those shells and wampum belts with chalk paint. Um, another work with uh, wampum where I made the bees out of $5 bills and then made a belt and carried it to different places to 
um, share some of the, the stories in those wampum belts, and talk about money and capitalism and treaties. And this is just me sharing, sharing the same work um, at the Papi Art Fair in Montreal. Um, this is, yeah, an early work from 2011, uh, where I've got copper plates tied to my feet and I'm walking along the shore in Lake Ontario, thinking about the ways that um, water and different relationships to landscape can be recorded. Um, I didn't have a lot of access to my language until a couple of years ago. So I was and kind of continually think about how we um, can, communi can communicate outside of spoken and written language. Um, this is a piece called Advancing Colors where I take porcupine quills and um, insert them into uh, drywall. And some more recent pieces. Uh, this is a work I did in a park where um, we've got some, an image of uh, quill work. Um, and then I've got the natural dyes that I use to dye the porcupine quills and they're dripping uh, from the vessels off of the, the image of the quill work onto my garment and my body. I'm kind of dying my, dying myself. And there's just a process picture of um, dyeing some porcupine quills. And then this is another example in a bathroom doing the same process where I'm taking the, um, those natural dyes of one's hibiscus um, and to kind of make basically making a strong hibiscus tea and um, dyeing myself. Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me here today. Um, me, no, Leland, I'm really happy to be here. Let me speak. Yeah, I'll go of Vanessa. Um, I'd be, uh, I would love to welcome um, Jennifer Wimigwans to please introduce herself. Thank you. Miigwech, Ange. Chi miigwech to uh, Dr. Sandra Stiers and Louis Booty for the invitation to this very cool panel and for organizing all of us. Um, I guess a little bit about me is um, my home community is Wakwamakwong, unceded territory, which is on Manitoulin Island. And I teach in the adult education and community development program at OISE University of Toronto. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you just a couple of ideas and concepts that I'm working with. Hopefully that'll be okay. Okay, so this is an important panel for me because it's only one of two artist panels that I've been invited to speak at. Um, in February 2021, I was invited by Maria Hupfield to speak at the Feminist Art Project Climate Relations, Indigeneity in Activism, Art, and Digital Media. That was organized by the Feminist Art Project and the College um, Art Association. I do not identify myself as an artist, but rather as Nad Magay. So that's what you see in Anishinaabemowin on the screen. So Nad Magay is a helper or one who is helping. Um, so, and this has been a really interesting process that, that's been going on literally since 1999. For those of you who don't know, I actually graduated with an MFA in film and video. So I do have a master's of fine arts. Although my work is involved with creative production, I never felt that the role of artists applied to me because of the way that I work within community. So for example, elders and knowledge keepers instinctively understand the role of helper. It means something very specific. And while I won't go into the details of that role here, I want to acknowledge its significance because it speaks to indigenous collective models of working together for the strengthening of community. So this role is understood intuitively by people like Maria and Sandra. And so I'm grateful to share how my work as Nada Magay contributes to indigenous resistance and resurgence through using the arts. 
So specifically in my case, creative skills. So I've continued to refine my skills since graduating in 1999 with an MFA. And these skills include interface design, writing, sound design, image creation, and production editing. I have created numerous digital projects with community. For example, fourdirectionsteachings.com is an online interactive website that was released in 2006 and is still going strong. So I can just share a few images with you. There are you know, quite a few on the site. I hope you get to um, visit it. I'm just gonna turn that off there. Okay. Okay. Okay, and then um, I also helped to create um, Nanabush and Nenbosh in 2017, which is uh, two um, Anishinaabe Bemoan language apps. And so I created those with the, with the Chiging First Nations Education Department and worked really closely with Alan Corbier. Um, but I don't have any images to show of that one right now. What is going on with my slides? Okay. And also I worked with Natural Curiosity, second edition 2017, and helped to create the original artwork and thinking through the Indigenous perspective regarding the layout for that piece. So these are some of the images that we developed. And they speak to the different thematics that were used in Natural Curiosity. And finally, um, I want to tell, tell you a little bit about um, Wampum Interactive 2012. That's when it was produced. And that was an interactive online touchscreen project for Parks Canada. And it was featured at Fort George's installation on the War of 1812. There I was asked to help produce the Indigenous perspective on the war and worked very closely, of course, with Rick Hill, Alan Corbier, and many other knowledge keepers. And so while this work is currently um, not available online, I am in the process of finding a new home for this work with, um, with hopefully, you know, that will include instructions for teachers uh, to facilitate learning in the classroom. Um, so I'll just show you a little bit here. I have a few images that is part of this project. And so I guess I just wanna conclude by saying what I find really exciting about this work is the way that we affirm the symbolic knowledge literacy of our own communities and privilege our own cultural signifiers for speaking to diverse conceptions of indigenous ontology and epistemology. And I look forward um, to learning more and talking more about this with the panel today. And um, yeah, just wanna say chi miigwech for inviting me to this lovely space. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, please, Tanis, introduce yourself. Hello, <laughs> thank you for having me here. Thank you uh, to all the organizers. It's great to see my friends and comrades again. So my name is Tannis, Tannis Nielsen. I'm a mother of multimedia artist and I'm currently on contract at OCAD. I'm a Anishinaabe Métis with Danish ancestry and I often call myself Danish, if some of you get that joke, right? Um, my grandmother, is, her name is Kitty Boucher. She was born in a Métis settlement of St. Louis, Saskatchewan. My grandfather, Joseph Monkman, was born right across the river in a place called Half Row District, which is right next to Duck Lake. And both families actually originally um, come from Peguis, Manitoba, but way back, like in like the early 1900s and 1880s, right? And um, my father was born in Copenhagen and he lived as a watchmaker in Denmark and has um, had worked and inspired many, many of my own projects actually with that clockworker mind, right? Um, so I quit school like grade seven, eight, nine, 12. Um, and then with the birth of my daughter in 93, I thought oh, I better make, try and make something of me, you know? So I had enrolled into U of T where I met the, Amazing, wonderful, smashing Maria Hapfield. Woo! Proud to link myself with Maria, being a fellow alumni to the Art and Art History Program at U of T. And then um, at that time too, uh, Rodney Bobby Wash was like one of the first teachers, mentors, friends who brought me into the community. 
And I was always kind of feeling, well, at that time, not anymore, <laughs> insecure with the white passing, red hair and freckles, right? And so Rodney was like, um, why don't you bring your, bring your paintings to the Friendship Center? And I was like, really? It's like, yeah, bring your paintings. And then, you know, the women said, oh, that looks like my cookum. That looks like my mom. Where are you from? And then, you know, you share your surnames and you make those uh, familial ancestral ties with community, even though you're so far away from those traditional lands, right? So that was really great. And then um, I focused on my grandmother for my thesis in 2004 and six, because at that time she was diagnosed with having Alzheimer's. And I thought, you know, um, if I turn grandma into a research project, the school will pay for me to go and visit her. And they did. And then I kept my camera on grandma with her permission for a number of weeks. And then, um, you know, came home and edited the film. And the work was about uh, Alzheimer's, ironically, as undoing uh, coloniality within my grandmother's cognition, right? Because she was taught by the gray nuns, did not attend a residential school. Um, it was a day school, the gray nuns. And she had not shared any language with me, but with the Alzheimer's, she started speaking in uh, Nehia, telling us, telling me these stories of how she made the bison robe coats. She put the collars on the coats, right? It was her job in making the bison robe coats for the RCMP and how they would like catch wild horses and train them and sell them. And all these great stories that she never um, shared with me when I was younger uh, due to this like assimilation. And, uh, but anyways, at that time, uh, I was very fortunate to have the advisor, uh, Simon Ortiz, who's an am amazing Acoma Pueblo poet as my advisor at U of T, we really had nothing in common, but <laughs> except for our indigeneity, right? And um, it was him who first put in my mind, him and um, Chief, sorry, him and Daniel Justice, who's Cherokee, uh, put in my mind decolonization through the arts. And I was like, because they were like, what are we going to call this class? And they both came up with the title Decolonization Through the Arts. And it was like my big aha, wow moment, right? Um, because my undergraduate degree, sorry to the art and art history at U of T, um, well, they should be sorry to me, because I was never presented with any aspect of indigeneity other than my teacher saying, hey, do you know Maria Hupfield? <laughs> like I, there was, it wasn't in uh, art history, it just wasn't there, right? And, um, so I was thankful for Simon Ortiz and, and Daniel Justice at that time, who led me on that pathway of that uh, decolonial methodology, right? And then through studying like our own art history to see that that literacy has always been there. You know, Western anthropology says it was never written, but we know in the pictographs and petroglyphs and baskets and, you know, it's there and performance too, like oral storytelling. And, uh, you know, those are amazing teachings. Like I recently did a project with the Anishinaabe elder, my cultural advisor, Marie Gadet, And um, she's telling a story about the time that the universe was created, right? And she says, at that first time, instead of the first time and like the, the importance of the different connotation between that first time and the first time allows for many first times, you know? So she um, has this great, great um, story that is the basis of the structure of this recent work that we did together on creation. And so those are our teaching methodologies, right? And um, physically, mentally, uh, cognitively, um, embedded within um, those kind of materials or, or performance, uh, oral storytelling. And so I find like today as an educator that I borrow a lot from those teachers, Bobby Wash and Simon Ortiz and Marie Gadette and Rose Logan and Lee Miracle, you know, everybody on the wall, right? 
when I give a job talk, like half my page is like just names of everybody who I'm borrowing from and um, to formulate my own thoughts going forward, right? And so today I think my pedagogy is like really closely also aligned with Paolo Freire, um, the godfather of uh, critical uh, pedagogy and Marie Batiste, which she talks about that constructivist uh, physical experiential way of learning. And my goal as an educator is for my students to become their own subjects in seeking their own liberation, you know, pedagogy of the oppressed, and also uh, to have a good life in your own subjective experience. Um, what does that look like? How do we get there? How do we achieve that? And um, yeah, that's my goal. It's just to, it's, you know, I'm wearing a shirt that says, love is the answer. This is my pedagogical methodology. <laughs> Anyways, I think I've probably rambled on too long. There's nobody here to pull my hair and say, that's enough. <laughs> I'll just let you keep going. It's fine. We're right. going to get into the conversation anyway. Um, since you all introduced yourself in that order, I'm actually going to just uh, kind of skip the line a little bit. So I'm going to um, ask Vanessa and then Jennifer and then Tanis, then Maria to respond to this first um, this first prompt. Um, it's, a, it's a prompt. It's not a it's not a lead. So take it wherever you want. Right. We want our conversation to be juicy. We want our conversation to be uh, back and forth. If you want to interject, don't feel like uh, you have to be quiet. Let's let's make this like we're in a real room together, okay? Um, so thank you for uh, for going ahead with uh, making the choice actually to work within the institution sometimes. Um, and so I wanted to start that uh, that conversation there with um, this actual uh, this fact, this aspect of choice, right? You you could choose to be an artist all over the world, wherever you want to work, right? But um, I wanted you to think a little bit about your experience um, within within the educational setting, like in a broad in a broad sense. Um, your experience within like this this research type setting, um, and I wanted to um, ask how that's how that's managed to shape uh, the approaches that you take now when um, starting and beginning to uh, expand maybe your artistic practice. Please go ahead, uh, Vanessa. Uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, this question makes me think of a, a lot of different things. Um, I mean, it's thinking about um, education settings and um, institutions, my personal, my familial and community like relationship. To all of those things, um, I yeah, I think about being the first, uh, being a small child and being a learner, um, and my mom, Dr. Susan Dion, um, who's a, a Oise alum. Um, we started. Um, she started her master's in education, and I started kindergarten on the same day. Um, so we kind of started this um, like uh, teaching and learning journey together. Um, and through that, um, I think that you, you brought up the institutional space. So I was always really aware of institutions and um, you know, spent many hours as a child in the YC library playing with the educational materials well, my mom wrote essays. So I think that really kind of set a, a framework for me in terms of how to engage with the institution. Um, but at the same time, I myself and my family was also really aware of all the harm that education had done um, in our family in terms of residential schools um, and then the um, day schools and um, just the, the power and discipline that um, that language or that, that education can take and the harm that it can do. Um, so in my in my art, I think I'm I come back to those themes because I really love teaching and learning. So um, I'm often, you know, some of the images I'm I'm telling a story, I'm sharing, I'm looking for people 
to kind of share my experience or share my understanding to create a conversation. Um, I think curiosity is a big part of my, my practice, like the images where I'm pouring the um, dyes over myself comes from watching the quills absorb the dye and thinking like, wouldn't it be really fun <laughs> to be that little quill in the dye bath? Um, and then that curiosity leads to like, why, why not? Why don't I pour this dye over myself? And then I can have that, have that feeling. Um, and yeah, I think that that can come from, part of that comes from an idea of curiosity and wanting to learn, maybe not so much, um, you know, some kind of knowledge, but to like learn a new experience. What does that, what does the quill feel like when I'm dying it? Oh, thanks. I'm finished speaking. Watch Vanessa. Um, yeah, I think with regard to this question, I think that actually um, being within um, a university space is actually more helpful than not. And that might sound like an odd thing to say, but when you work as a helper trying to uh, create Indigenous knowledge projects where you're working with community, it's not the best fit for um, art envelopes, right? Art councils um, fund a particular kind of project. They fund a particular kind of way of positioning yourself. And I don't position myself as an artist. So it was always kind of problematic to go to arts councils for this kind of work. Um, but I also can say that what's really scary is that nowhere in Canada, not even Canadian heritage, do we have a funding body that's committed to funding Indigenous knowledge projects? So being in the university is one of the only places where I can actually apply for grants like um, the Indigenous Timekeepers Project and get funding to research and work with international Indigenous communities on their specific calendar projects, and then translate and help those communities think about what is it that they want to share, and then we can put those into digital, um, you know, platforms, right, for, for people to disseminate and share their knowledge. And so, yeah, it's, it's this funny kind of you know, when you're doing something that doesn't really exist within the standard models, it takes a while to try to find those right places to exist. And I'm not saying that university settings are ideal, but it's better than, you know, it was much, it's far harder for me to do this kind of Indigenous knowledge work and get funding for those kinds of projects outside of the university. Because we know places like Ontario Media Development Corporation, Telefilm, I applied to all those places to try to do media-based works, but because there wasn't an ROI, a return on investment, they didn't want to fund those projects, right? Because they want money-making projects. They want, you know, like really, uh, you know, um, cachet projects like that ha will have a big profile. So I share all that. And I guess I could just end by saying that, you know, I think um, also with the notion of, you know, all of those projects I just showed you, aside from Natural Curiosity, uh, which is a print publication, all those projects are what I would call digital bundles, right? And so even with digital bundles, which I qualify as Indigenous knowledge projects, um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, in, in my work in the academy, to be um, invited. So like I'm working with um, Jane Wolf, and we've, uh, she's been working with uh, the Biennale site at 72 Perth Avenue. So we're, um, I was invited to work with them on a public um, installation and it's called the Toronto Landscape Observatory. So I'll be using a teaching and creating an augmented reality piece, right? So here we will have another digital bundle de um, delivered in AR. And then also, as I mentioned earlier with the Timekeepers Project, we are looking at VR. So working with virtual reality. And so that's really exciting because that's another piece that we can find and use with the research dollars. And then finally, um, through the Knot New Researcher Grant, <laughs> being a new person in the academy, being tenure track, I was able to get funding to update for directionsteachings.com with an Indigenous languages component, right? So yeah, so 
I just want to put that out there when you're kind of working in this way as a helper, maybe uh, trying to utilize the university to strategically fund those kinds of projects is important, but I also think it's a great way to speak back to Canadian um, states around what kind of funding envelopes they're offering and try to educate them about the importance of Indigenous knowledge projects. So I've also been doing that in my role um, at OISE. Miigwech. I'm excited to see your projects. They sound amazing. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, how have your experiences with education, the question, uh, and research shaped approaches in your artistic practice? Um, um, that's what I'm gonna speak about. Is, um, so quitting school in grade seven was not a choice, right? Like that's uh, kind of um, obvious, right? Um, it was circumstance, right? Call it a colonial conundrum. Right. Um, so that's why I'm very much interested in the Paul Affairs work, critical uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. But and that's why also like a lot of my emergent artwork was um, speaking back to the academy and trying to undo this coloniality. Right. And so then for a moment, my specialty became uh, in critiquing the coloniality of the academy in the content pedagogy and administration, right? And the economy of the academy, which is one of academic capitalism, right? Talk about resource extraction, you know, cognitive resource extraction, which after the land was extracted, you know, our children, like uh, languages. Um, Bobby Wash once said, the human genome project with the DNA. And that's like one of the last places to colonize is like our, our biology, our genetics. But now it's like, you know, uh, cognitive, cognitive intellectual extraction that I'm often speaking against within the academy. And I talk, started talking in 2014 about the need to talk about the ethics of acquisition and dissemination of indigenous knowledge and information because my stuff was being hijacked all the time without being given a reference or any citation, right? Which is ironic because there's uh, research ethic boards and things within these places. But anyways, um, so my opinion is not often popular. <laughs> and when I go to give a research talk or a job talk, I'm talking about the coloniality of the institution that I'm trying to get a job in, <laughs> which is also not popular, but it's also tiring, right? And so um, that's why I look like, oh, I was going to forget it. It's tiring. And so I need to ensure to make space for uh, not being in a binary opposition. I wish I learned that long ago. I wish I was thinking about that when I was an emerging artist, that I didn't have to be in this position of fighting all the time. But the immediacy of need, right? Thinking of Taiki, Alfred, the, Im the immediacy of need in defense I felt like, you know, a snake in a corner, right? Like I just had to like, you know, you're often put in that position where you're faced with this gross misrepresentation and you, you, you're compelled. Your ancestors are like, speak, 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 right? Um, but one of the latest projects that I worked on has nothing to do with colonization. It's all about the birth of creation, right? And um, it's such good medicine for me to be in that space. And the process of, you know, speaking with Marie uh, Gadet, well, learning from Marie Gadet and um, hearing her sing, and it's just uh, an amazing singer, right? Um, it's much more healthy for me to be in that space. So I prefer to be in that space. And I only really speak about uh, decolonization or attempt to really, um, Put any effort in towards that when I'm in the institution. But when I'm at home, I want to, you know, do the things that are nourishing and medicinal for me and my family. But um, honestly, at the beginning of the pandemic, I told my friend Elwood Jimmy, uh, 
I had just gotten two canvases, six feet by four feet. And I said to him, yeah, I'm gonna paint myself decapitating John A. McDonald's head. <laughs> and then Elwood was like, is that what the world needs now? And then I was like, oh, you're right, you know? Uh, so I started to do this painting of my daughter, which is speaking towards uh, prophecy and the need for, you know, John Trudell talks about what it means to be a human being. And in that excellent podcast, he talks about how the European tribes forgot or let go of their relationship to land. And because they did that, they forlot, forgot or let go of what it means to be a good human being, right? So I'm doing a painting about that with my daughter and, um, you know, all our relations and the water, the sentient beings that are around her, um, most of them are on the endangered list, right? Um, so I'm thinking of messages of what the world needs now. <laughs> Um, as inspired by my good friend, who uh, Elwood Jimmy, who always gives these really generative questions, right? And um, yeah, so I bring that over into my pedagogy, you know, with the students, right? Like individually, like I try and have them, you know, this is where you're located geographically. And I get them to do land acknowledgements and, um, you know, to practice the pronunciation of nations and um, the ethics and protocols of the governance of here. Like, what is the constitution of this land? What are the natural laws of this place? And why, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, does that only work for the Romans? Like, where are you located? And then to have a dialogue, right? Okay, and then where are you from? Right. And um, so I teach a lot of um, INBC courses, Indigenous Visual Culture courses. And some of my non Indigenous students are like, well, how do I enter into the, the, the topics, the politic? And I say, from your own subjective positioning, right? It has to be a dialogue. So um, rather than painting, uh, you know, the gross consumption of a uh, Westward expansion, manifest destiny, doctrine of discovery. <laughs> Rather than just reproduce that, show a dialogue of you undoing that, you know, using your own um, teachings from your own land and your, you know, emancipatory strategies that might have been handed down, you know, in your history and in your family, right? Um, yeah, because we're at a crisis point, you know, environmentally and uh, Trudeau said, yeah, we're losing our sense of humanity. And so that is um, where I'm at with my art and pedagogy. Thanks, Tannis. Um, yeah, when I think of the institution, um, two things come to mind. One is that I work with the institution um, both academically and then also through arts institutions. So I'm constantly in conversation with these spaces. Uh, you know, I'm looking at this question here in the chat that talks about um, being being in but not of, right? So um, the thing is to be included, but wanting to be included on my own terms. So having to make a decision from the get go, um, who is this serving? You know, that I don't want to be institutional or I don't want to become institutionalized and I also don't want to be instrumentalized or tokenized. So is there, you know, is it something that's in service of me? Have people worked with Indigenous folks before? You know, this is a constant question I um, come up against, whether it's with other academics who want to work alongside me, or are they actually wanting to work alongside me from the start? Um, have they worked with Indigenous people before? Um, and then similarly, as an artist, do they know my art? You know, are they actually interested in the questions I'm asking? And I find because of the way racism functions and sexism, that's always the case. Sometimes, um, you know, folks are trying to fill a gap, check a box. Um, and so it quickly becomes a process of evaluating the situation. So... Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think what else I want to say about institutions. I can also share that for me, um, 
educate, so I come from a family of educators. It's a lot, you know, I'm named after someone who ran, you know, worked in our, on the res at their school for a long time. Um, my whole family's in there. My grandma was a um, kindergarten school teacher. You know, it's really in my, in my family in all kinds of ways on both sides, both my native and non-native. So I'm aware of these very different approaches. Um, so one thing I like to think about the institution is um, that there's many ways to be an artist and also many ways to be an educator. And so sometimes conversations happen within these spaces, but also they don't always have to. There's many other ways as well. So I liked what Jennifer was saying about, for her, it was really useful to access resources. It means a lot when an institution, whether it's a fellowship or, um, you know, a tenure track position that finally fits in the best way possible um, or becomes available, these sorts of things that those bring with them a lot of resources that can then be redirected. So if you're being respected in the way that one would hope you would be <laughs> um, and you have the freedom to drive that, then you can advance all these agendas on your terms. And that's where it becomes so exciting because then, um, you know, I spent the year of COVID redirecting a lot of my research funds into partnerships so that the money was going towards the community um, instead of, um, you know, and the programs that they were doing. So really reconnecting on that level. So there's a lot of ways to um, channel and funnel that, but it's it's hard if you have a chair that is trying to make you um, work and teach so many courses, doesn't recognize that you have um, minority taxes placed on you, doesn't understand the issues, the emotional exhaustion that you receive through so many things, right? Like there's a lot that's there that constantly makes me question um, my position within the institution and also the boundaries that I have and putting up strong boundaries because I can't do everything um, and wanting to just focus on doing a few things very well. And also that I don't have to do everything. Like there's now at this moment, I think there's 72 indigenous faculty at U of T and at UTM where I'm working, we have, we went in three years from zero to five indigenous faculty. So things are, you know, it's, I'm optimistic, but only also because I know we have a vice principal who is from New Zealand and really is backing us. So, um, you know, they want to do something, you know, Liz got, um, Alex Gillespie is really committed to this and serious about it. So that's not always the case, whether it's a curator or the chair of your department or, you know, your colleagues. So it's a constant um, work of not trying to get fatigued. Anyway, those are some thoughts that I have. Thank you, Maria. Um, might as well share a tiny little bit of a uh... I guess why I like to teach um, with other educators before we into the next question, I think it's connected up to uh, definitely the way that I was raised too. you know, like we have uh, my mom, my mom didn't graduate high school, my dad didn't graduate high school, nobody in my family graduated high school um, until uh, my older sister, right, but my mom was a substitute teacher. She was going on every single field trip and she was teaching us every single damn thing she knew um, in her own way, right? So everything we did growing up was exceptionally uh, hands-on, like bizarrely exceptionally hands-on. And I think that's kind of really um, shaped the way that I work as an artist. I wanna get to know people. I wanna just dive right into it and actually do something with my hands because um, that's the way that I learn, right? So I wanted to think about some of that, um, some of that access that students now, your students, students that you've engaged with over the time, um, with all this access they've had to your indigenous excellence as artists and educators, right? Um, within this setting, you know, how have you used your art? How do you see art in general, right? Um, being used, how would you like to inspire uh, the critical conversations that that you want to have, uh, particularly around how we learn, who we learn from, 
you know, why, when, where, all of those kind of ideas around, um, around shifting um, education, shifting research. So um, with your experience in, you know, engaging your students, um, what kind of uh, critical conversations, critical thoughts, I guess, are you hoping to, uh, working to inspire um, in that way? I'm gonna leave it open actually. So whoever wants to jump on it, let's, let's open this up, right? If you hear something that someone else said and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I do too. Let's open it up because I think what would be really good from this conversation is to grab some tools from all of you. Um, we have some great people in the audience today. So let's share some of those wonderful tools. What are we hoping to, uh, to inspire with regard to critical thought and how we learn? I can jump in there. Um, I think as a, um, a maker and also a performance artist or so someone who makes things and then activates those in live performance and video, I think a lot about um, doing, you know, I talk to my students about the practice of doing, the practice of making, of thinking with our hands. So a lot of experiential learning and then also embodying knowledge. So what we carry with us, what we embody, what we, um, evoke. And I think those are very much coming from and drawing from oral tradition. So the way that in oral tradition, um, you know, we, we don't write things down, we write them down to forget them, right? But if you live them, then you keep them in mind at all times. Um, and so those are things that I think about. And then if you're embodying it, then you're also thinking about living with accountability or also what um, poet Natalie Diaz talks about living with consequence, right? Like how we can be responsible um, beings um, in relation with all of our relations, right? And so those are, anyway, those are some thoughts I'll, I can throw out there for my, my peers here. I think of, um, I'm just thinking of like the Simcoe mural on front and front Simcoe. <laughs> I'm thinking about um, the process, of, which is still continuing. Um, I had to do a scale uh, to see why it was taking me so long. Um, it's actually combined 440 feet. And the Statue of Liberty is 300 feet. So the Simcoe mural is like 14 stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. So I don't feel so bad that it's taking me so long. We took a two, two year pause. But anyways, that's off topic. But in doing the Simcoe mural, it's really about the process. And I find that a lot with, with most of my work, it's not like the final outcome. It's the process and what knowledge is gained, what community, relations are made, um, the sharing of ideas and, and gifts with one another. Like I'd be, I'm a night person, right? So I would go to the mural at 7 p.m. at night and I would paint until 10 in the morning by myself. But that's because I became good friends with the urban campers. That's what the men sleeping under the bridge, it's oh, urban campers, right? They always had my back. And I noticed that, um, they would adjust their sleeping schedules. So one of them was always awake with me, uh, Mitch and Alex. And then like, sometimes they would help me paint and like a reciprocal exchange, right? And then Alex said to me, Tess, why aren't you letting me paint up there? And he pointed up to the roof. And I said, cause I don't have insurance for you to go up on the lift. And he's like, well, what do I care about heights? He's like, I jumped out of 28 perfectly working good planes, planes in my life. And I'm like, he jumped out of planes. And then I learned that he was a veteran, right? But um, he also reads like a book a day, like, like every day, a new book. And so the conversations and the knowledge that I learned from Alex was just amazing. And then um, Mitch is an ex-politician. Um, they, they've since both been housed, but their support and their friendship at that mural. Um, Mitch actually ended up doing the professional documentation of the mural because he's quite into photography, right? Um, and then one time I wasn't there and Niall Johnson, who's an amazing uh, artist from Cape Croker uh, related to Basel, um, who calls himself, you know, the urban rock painter, right? Following in that tradition. 
of uh, petroglyphs and pictographs. He said, um, he sent me pictures, Niles, and he uploaded them to Instagram of how he said the suits from the business district came and asked him what he was painting. And Niles was painting this beautiful, like 200 foot long scroll, right? About creation and, and his family and their life and their journey. And um, the suits were painting. Niles gave them a paintbrush and they were helping paint on the wall. And everybody looks so happy. And there is a, this coming together of two seemingly disparate peoples, right? But it's, um, that's what I think we need to do. And that's what I think that the mural does. I hope that it does. So to act as a land acknowledgement, but to also have an entry point uh, for pedestrians into like the pedagogy of place, right? Which comes through um, the teachings of the elders and teachers on the wall, because eventually there's gonna be quotations um, so like under Rodney, there will be like a quote from Rodney and under Lee, there will also be a quote. And so it allow the pedestrians to gain an understanding or an entryway to the pedagogy of this place and to hopefully inspire a conversation about um, being good humans. And as Maria was talking about, um, and good relations with all our relations, right? Um, yep, I rambled. I love what you're talking about in terms of like the movement and the action. And I always, um, whether I'm like learning or teaching, my um, favorite kind of spaces are when there can be that collaboration. We can move around, and I found that uh, like observe each other, learn from each other, share with each other. I found um, as a as a student in school, one of the reasons I didn't like a lot of classes was because you had to sit in your chair and you only had to look at your own paper. And I didn't understand why that was the setup for like math class and English class. But if we were working in other subjects, um, you know, in in elementary school, you know, like art or gym, um, then it was only in those subjects that you were allowed to uh, connect with your body and you could um, have your body interact with your learning and you could get up and get a material or comment on someone else's work, say, I like what you're doing. And um, in, yeah, I try and also um, make space for that in my teaching um, because yeah, that's just my favorite, my favorite part about, about learning. And that's really what I, um, I heard in your, your stories, Tanis, thanks for sharing. Yeah, miigwech to everybody um, for sharing. I, I think with me, when I'm working with the students, what I'm really trying to impart are these collective models, right? As you can tell, like the role of a helper is about a collective model of working and collaborating. And so with my students, um, I teach every class with a check-in. We go around the room and people check in and say how they're feeling. And one of the reasons for this um, way of working is to bring in those kinds of Indigenous um, methodologies and those Indigenous ways of being and the way of the way we start in community, but also to acknowledge that everyone has a gift, right? And so how do we humble ourselves in that circle to everyone's gifts? And so again, I just really, um, I think in terms of my education and research and how it's shifting is that it's shifting to bring in those, um, those models, those indigenous models and to really honor and put them into practice. <laughs> and so putting them into practice in the classroom, putting them into practice in the way I want to be, um, introducing myself in these spaces as a helper, right? As Nagma Gay, um, just putting into practice how students can, um, you know, learn to collaborate instead of compete, learn to um, try to understand what this person possesses in terms of gifts, instead of trying to knock them down for their faults, right? So these are Indigenous these are Indigenous teachings, right, to act with kindness. So yeah, trying to bring that into the university spaces. Um, so yeah, miigwech. 
Thank you. Um, I'm like, I'm already, I'm already ready. I'm ready to learn from all of you. Okay. I really want to, um, I always think about this, you know, when we have so many great minds in one room, what could happen if we all do something together? Okay, next step, next project. Um, so <laughs> I think a lot about what does it mean to return to a conversation, right? What does it mean to return to um, your favorite shape? I think about the way that we think about um, our Indigenous ontologies, right? We mentioned uh, this idea around like symbolic knowledge literacy, which I think is so, so, so important. Um, but also like how important it is, as you mentioned, to uh, to put some of these things into practice. So for myself, I often think about um, concepts like um, like a circle, right? Concepts like um, like returning to talk, exactly, like annual visits, like maybe there's a time in the year where we got to do something. And I think that we all have these understandings, um, absolutely, and are bringing them to our practices. So what I wanted to do was um, just ask you actually a question around um, this, this act of, uh, of bringing um, your symbolic knowledges your approach to your Indigenous ontology, knowing that we are all from various different places. Um, how do you think you could use that, that kind of sharing of symbols, sharing of understandings? How have you been speaking through some of these, um, these images to, uh, to provoke dialogue, to think of resistance, um, to, you know, inspire, inspire learning? What kind of, sh I actually, when I get down to it, I'm like, what are your favorite shapes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but really, you know, let's let's use shapes to actually start talking about this. You know, shapes and how we how we visualize methodologies. Uh, yeah, um, I would love to actually throw this to Tanis first, um, and then we'll flip it around. Oh, shapes are good. <laughs> Um, so I'm just thinking, like, uh, especially in removing hierarchy, right? You know, sitting in a circle. Um, removing interference and barriers between us, right? Um, and I also think of the notion of non-interference with like, you know, traditional parenting styles, right? And, um, you know, so we're together collectively in a circle, but each one of us has our own autonomy, right? Our own thoughts, and our own interests, right? Um, so I actually, um, in teaching, like my students, especially the first years, like they always want a rubric, right? But I never use rubrics. And then um, when I tell them that their project is open, they kind of look at me like a deer caught in the headlights, right? Like they don't know where to move, right? Freedom? What do you mean? I have freedom to create what I want to create? <laughs> yeah, but, right? <laughs> and there's a big but. It has to be in relation to course content. It has to be approved by me and your peers going forward, just to make sure you don't, you know, do some terrible cultural appropriation or something like that in your work. And um, we build and facilitate your project together, your own individual interests. So that's where Freire's concept of this, the learner becomes the subject comes in. And also the notion of non-interference where I'm just facilitating, right? what their interests are, you know? Um, so rather than having like that banking in, uh, intellect uh, that the Western Academy does or like reiterating what they think I want them to think, no, right? So I, I often start by asking my students, what's at the forefront of your mind these days? Nina Simone has a great quote on YouTube, right? Where she's speaking and says, the, the response, the duty and responsibility for the artist, I think, is to reflect the times. Nina Simone says, how could you not reflect the times, right? It, like, and I agree that though some students don't want to be political and they don't have to be political. Are you interested in science? Are you interested, like, what's at the forefront of your mind? And how could we make your interests in dialogue with the class course content, right? Let's facilitate that. So I actually end up um, instructing students individually, which is a hell of a lot more work than saying, okay, everybody read this, right? 
because I'll have, I'll, I'll give each individual student their own readings, right? And so it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. And then I also tell my students, you know, debate me, argue with me. You don't, you don't have to take what I say, right? And I said, a thesis is an argument. And one time a student said to me, well, uh, in jest, I said, um, well, can I argue that colonization was a good thing? And I'm like, you could try. I said, without citing and referencing any right wing or KKK uh, sources, you could try. I don't think it's gonna work. Um, but I am really heavy on research and I demand that they position themselves, learn how to position yourself where are you situated in relation to what, right? And, um, and I think, so, and I tell them, if you wanna defend an argument, prove to me that you have the language of that positioning, right? So if you're in the anti-colonial, anti-capitalist or this feminist uh, theoretical discourse, I wanna hear the terminology, right? And I think, um, like when I wrote my thesis, I did it without punctuation or uh, capitalization, because I said to my friend, Rebecca de Babadong, I said, I'll be damned if they're gonna take a mark off because I don't know how to properly punctuate or where to put this comma. I said, I don't wanna write with punctuation or capitalization. And then Rebecca said, well, Peter Cole didn't write with any punctuation. So there was, um, I had a reference. Somebody had set precedent. And so Rebecca and my conversation was like research, right? And then um, I found a quote, an amazing quote, quote by Noguji Wathiango, who's on Facebook, by the way. And he said, um, to use the language of the colonizer was to pay homage to them. So I had that as backup. And so like the more, the more research and language that I learned, I felt, gave me a stronger place to stand, right? In, in my defense, you know? Um, but I don't agree with grading. I don't agree with grades at all. I think, well, the grades were originally part of the bell curve, Gaussian function, uh, uh, originally used as a form of scientific racism. Um, to measure so-called normative intellect, but normative intellect was a Eurocentric intellect, right? And um, Eurocentricism is the norm of the academy, universality, all that. And um, I have students who will do a tea ceremony for a project. How am I supposed to grade that, right? You know, oh, your ability to pray, all right. You know, it's just like, no. Oh. And then the grade distribution requirement also then gets students competing with another in the system of academic capitalism, which is antithetical to what I believe is a Nishnabe pedagogy, right? Um, and even the United, ne United Nations declarations on the right of indigenous people, when they talk about our right for intellectual self-determination, I say I shouldn't have to grade. And I'm telling admin all this all the time. I'm like, you know, every term I'm like defending my grades, right? With the stuff. But anyways, um, I rambled on again. That's no problem, Janice. That's what I want. So uh, I do notice um, Vanessa clapping back. So uh, feel free, take it away, Vanessa. What's your uh, favorite shape? So <laughs> how do you like <laughs> um, Yeah, how would you? How would you grade a favorite? Like, a, how would you grade a shape? Um, I mean, we could make we could make it up. Like, oh, it's a really good circle. Your circle is better than the other. Um, you know, that really depends on your perspective. Um, certainly, um, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people make circles differently and work through them differently. And so, we're like right there, we know that those two communities have different understandings of how to make a circle. Um, I make circles literally in my in my quill work and shapes literally, but I like what you're what you're getting at here in terms of um, the the metaphors and the way that they 
can um, these these shapes have different um, pedagogical and cultural understandings. Um, I just beside me, I also brought up. Oops, no, it's dropping it on the floor. Second, um, a piece, and it's a. So yeah, it's like how would we how would we grade this shape, and like even what is it? You know, I think if people wanted to like put in the chat what they see, we would get a lot of different answers. And you can do you could do that if you wanted if you wanted to just pop in there what what you see. We wanted to get participatory about it. <laughs> Right, so we're getting a few, a few answers. And then, I don't know, is it still the same? Do we still see the same thing? If we go this way or this way, right? What about like, if we turn it around, then what does it like become? Or like, if we look at it really up close, then what ha what what happens? So I just think about these these processes of you know even I think the first step is to we have to under like have an experience of looking or observing what somebody is sharing with us. And I agree with Tana's. I think it's really um, it's often a really violent process to uh, grade somebody. And the systems come from um, intellectual hierarchy, which is also tied to eugenics, and um, being the input in that categorization um, is can be very colonial and violent. So that's why I, I love what you're saying, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead, Tennis. I can. Two sentences. I'm just. Thank you. That's not to say that I don't have really high expectations of my kid, well, of my students. I shouldn't say kids, right? Because like, well, with my kid, he's 29. I say, I expect you to do this, 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 and that. And I expect these things because I know you're brilliant and you're capable of this, 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 and that, right? And this is the accountability if you don't do this, 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 and that, right? So I still carry that over into my classroom. So, um, I have high expectations, even though I don't want to, um, I don't believe in the grade distribution. I don't believe in grades, but I have high expectations. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, thank you. Oh, no, no, miigwech, Tannis. No, I, I wanted to just comment that I really appreciated, um, you know, Tannis, you talking about the dreaded rubric. And I also really appreciate uh, Vanessa bringing in the different consumptions of the circle from the Haudenosaunee and, you know, um, say Anishinaabe views of the circle and how to work through the circle. And so I think one of the things that I try to do with my students is to provoke that dialogue and inspire learning by talking about and, and really thinking about Edward Benton Bonnet Ba, who said, all creation stories are true, right? What if we start from that premise? Well, how does that change the dynamic and the dialogue? So I just really, um, yeah, appreciate what, what you are all saying. And, and that when we think about that and, and you know, what Edward Benton Bonnet Ba said, then we really are looking at those relationships and contexts. And we're really looking at, you know, again, that fundamental respect. Um, you know, we don't see, you know, I don't think that there would be these like, yeah, they're, they're, when you go to visit somebody's lodge, you don't go in there with a sense of disrespect, right? You go there with a sense of humility. So just wanting to share that and, and how that brings in those concepts again around observing and sharing. Gwetch. I guess I can talk about shapes. Sorry, Angie, I was waiting for you to say, now Maria. <laughs> well, you really um, are putting it to me because I haven't been thinking a lot about shapes. So you have me thinking about something new today. Um, yeah, and the little wheels are going. Um, since the pandemic has happened, I've been thinking a lot more about sound in voice. So I often um, incorporate things in my, the things that I make, my mashups that make sound. Um, 
And also when I perform, I often don't speak. So I've been starting to um, look at that a little more, usually because I'm so busy doing stuff. So the idea of talking while I'm doing, you know, but I'm figuring it out now that I discovered microphones. So uh, <laughs> put a mic in my hand. Um, and I also have been thinking a lot about movement and that's also because of the pandemic from sitting still in one place. So this idea of movement being medicine. So it, perhaps if we're thinking about shapes, there are of course shapes that can go with that, like a wave or all kinds of other, um, you know, sound wave or what is the choreography score of the movement. Um, but the shapes I suppose that uh, I've used in the past so in the classroom definitely would be the circle, but specifically being from Georgian Bay, being from the snow belt and having four directions, like four definite seasons um, and this idea of the circle and the medicine wheel. Uh, one thing I talk a lot about with my drama students, because I'm cross appointed with drama and English and then the Department of Visual Studies is that um, in the medicine wheel, as many of us here know, we have um, the mind and the body being two quadrants. And those are areas that we deal with all the time in academia. But the other two parts, the other two slices of pie in that wheel um, that have to do with emotion and spirit are not acknowledged. And so with my theater students, that's something we talk about is how do we walk in a balanced way holistically? And that has been something that has been really useful in this time of the pandemic. So I'll share that. And then, um, we do, yeah. And then the other shape I think a lot about, or I, I don't think a lot about it, but I've used it in my work. And so one of the images you saw was a spiral. <laughs> And that came from a conversation with um, Alan Corbier, again, right, <laughs> fluent language speaker, who was telling me about the spiral. And he said, well, you know, Maria, the spiral, um, when you see that, that's um, the moment right before underwater panther is about to appear on the surface of the water. So when you see that on the surface of the water, you know they're coming. And I when I heard that, I, I knew right away that I wanted to be underwater panther. I wanted to make the circle, I cut this head flap, I put these jingles spiraling into the middle, and then I popped my head through the head flap so I could be underwater panther. So a lot of the other shapes I think about have to do with like zigzags and diagonals. So a lot of dynamic energy, something that has a lot of power so that I can um, assert my own agency and feel empowered in these spaces that I'm constructing as an artist. I said, woohoo, but my mic was off. I got, I got so excited. I was like, woohoo. Mm -hmm. I love that. Good. I did, I did want to give the chance actually for us to uh, just like do little like, I like this. I like the, I don't know, let's press popcorn, like things that other people said that we were like, yeah, I do that too. Um, I, uh, I, um, I just think a lot about the up, the upside down bowl and then like flipping it over. That's been my game lately. Like thinking of like, oh, I make the basket and then I flip it over and then the people are in it, <laughs> right? And then the things happen, uh, but also using it as a way to describe uh, everything, cosmology, the way that we need to care for stuff, what we need to carry, all of those kind of conversations, right? Um, but let's just take it for like two more minutes. Let's just popcorn back and forth. Anything that jumped out from other things that people said. I wanted to just add like with um, this discussion is that, you know, Monique Mojica is doing some really beautiful work with um, Kuna knowledge. And so she's using like pattern literacy, right? And so I'm working with her on the Mola Dula Media Collective to how can we like create this body movement of symbols like Kuna symbols and what does that mean to, to kind of work in that way? So yeah, just listening to everyone speak about that, it brought up the really wonderful work she's doing and actually just a little thing she's going to be um, a, a book coming out really soon on pattern literacy from like an indigenous perspective um, yeah written by her and I can't think of her co-author right now but when it when it comes to my mind I'll, I'll let you know miigwech you know what I'm, I just I'm... thought oh sorry 
No, I just wanted to say I'm obsessed with Monique Mojica's ideas around pattern literacy, but also rhythm literacy, right? Then like, ooh, this is what we're missing. We're missing um, embodied rhythm, right? How do we learn something? Well, you toss it, you turn it, you flip it, and it goes there. And it makes sense if you do it the same way all the time, right? Take it away, Tannis. Well, I'm just ex excited about a recent eBay purchase because um, Robert Hull's uh, show is closing on the 16th, I think at the AGL, Red is Beautiful. And um, I was reading about Robert's, um, you know, his ideation on some projects, right? And he said that he was inspired by this text and it was first printed in um, like the 1940s and it says uh, Ojibwe crafts, right? But it's got 216 illustrations in it. And I just bought the first edition. So I'm very excited to have like a book that also inspired, you know, the iconic Mr. Robert Cool. So anyways, lots of shapes in that book. I see a new tattoo coming. I think if we're going to evoke some spaces into the room, I'd really like to focus also take some time to acknowledge and focus the women makers who are who did a lot of the hand weaving the abstract designs that reference things like creation stories. Um, and the way that these textile based pieces really um, embodied whole cosmo cosmologies in that way if we're thinking about their fin the finger woven. Um, twine bags that on one side had um, sky world thunderers and on the other side the creature whose name we do not speak of underwater panther and the stuff in the middle is the stuff for us right so in this way you know if we think of um the the ones who who keep the world together one, the ones who hold everything together the older you know the older one beings these women these elder roles that um, that really was there, you know, from the in those designs right through. And I think that there's generations, like generations of um, artists, people like Robert Hull and other artists of that time who really went back into the archives to find those sources, um, to fill in that knowledge that was missed because of things like residential school. And so that as we're now in this moment of cultural revitalization, that it really shows the strength of that work. Um, I remember seeing this exhibition at the Met on Plains Indian art, and they had contemporary art and then all these amazing historical items. And my husband, Jason, said, you know, it's a shame they put those together. And I was like, oh, you know, why would you say that? Is that because you don't think this other stuff is art? And he goes, no, Maria. That's not it at all. It's because it's better than art and it makes this other art not, you know, therefore not look so good <laughs> because they were masterfully made, like incredibly, you know, how could you not wear these and feel so much cultural strength? And so these are things that I think of when I think of art. So I'm not, although I'm educated, formally educated in um, academia, in the arts, visual arts, the art school, all of that, you know. Um, I'm also have always been mindful of how, and this is why I love every opportunity I can be with you, Jennifer Weming Um, It's because looking at that methodology, indigenous methodology and how to, pr to protect and promote that knowledge as much as possible and the ways in which we do that. And I think that those, those ones before us are the ones who were doing that in such a very straightforward way. So we always have to, um, always like to take that moment to go back to that. Thank you. Uh, thanks for speaking, Maria. Well, it's one, uh, it's almost 1.30 guys. So uh, we've been chatting for a little while. I think it is, uh, it is time to wrap things up. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to thank you all for taking the time to have these conversations. Um, I'm inspired by Vanessa's prompt. So before we finish off here, uh, I would love for whoever's in the room, um, answer the same question, man. What's your, uh, what's your favorite teaching shape? What's the thing that we should 
what's something that you want to learn through a way an indigenous ontology that you are truly you truly want to start to dig your i don't know whatever you want to dig into it <laughs> in okay um so let's let our chat with that to close us off how do we want to work which shapes do we want to use to get deeper into information? You know, I am, um, I'm truly inspired by that zigzag shape and the shape. Yeah. People shapes the, the, these, I've been working so much in these ideas of these little weird square boxes we live in and all these wiggly, wonderful, beautiful forms that are inside these spaces, right. As humans. So um, thank you all for uh, pulling some of this information into, um, into our chat for having this open conversation. Um, I'd love to keep having these, uh, these conversations as we go forward. So in the idea of returning to talk, let's make this happen again, all right? Let's invite more ed artists and educators uh, into this conversation. Um, thank you all for, for being there uh, for this. Now I'll go, uh, I'll turn it over unless, unless we are done. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. I think um, Dr. Sandra Starr's director had some closing remarks. Thank you. I just wanted to thank each of the panelists. Um, thank you, Ange, for moderating um, the panel. And thank you to our artists. Um, this was such an inspiring conversation. You know, I was thinking of some of the big themes that we talked about, uh, land, ethics of relationality, story work, um, the ways that, you know, the importance of naming, <clears throat> the importance of, of thinking through the ways that different artistic expressions um, can in invoke and provoke critical conversations. Um, and can flip narratives and take in for granted assumptions. So you have to look at them differently than you did. It, it forces you to, to have to stop and really think about what you're looking at and what, what it's saying to you, what it's speaking to you. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. What a powerful way to end the term with this amazing panel. And I agree with you, um, Angie, I think we should do this again. I think this was really great. So thank you all. And thank you, Lois, for bringing us together. All right. Well, thank you, Lois. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everyone who attended. It was wonderful to have you all in this space together. I'm so excited for what will happen in the future with um, Indigenous excellence and amazing artistic pedagogy. So uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Okay. Onagiwahi. <laughs>